Hva synes du om at vi har fått en kvinne som statsminister? Ja, akkurat noen personlig mening om kvinne eller mann, det har jeg ikke egentlig, men sånn at den gjør jobben sin, så er det samme om det er kvinne eller mann, mener jeg. Ja, for jeg tror at mennene passer best i denne jobben. Hvorfor det? Jo, for de har jo litt mer erfaring i mange år tilbake. Ja, jeg tror vi gjør det like bra som Norli. Hun har virket veldig fin før, på alt hun har gjort før, så hvorfor ikke salgsminister? Og jeg tror at hun kan utrette mye mer enn en mann kan gjøre, egentlig. Hvis hun, hvis hun er seg sitt ansvar bevisst, da. Til en slik post, så synes jeg det er bedre med mann. Sikkert hun bra som menneske, alt mulig, men ikke som statsminister. Your Royal Highness, Crown Princess Mette Marit, Excellencies, ladies, gentlemen and others. On behalf of CARE, Norfen and NHO, it is a great pleasure for me to welcome you all to this conference. We have just now watched a clip from when Norway got our first female prime minister in 1981. And we can laugh of some of the comments, and I sure do. But this 36-year-old clip is nonetheless highly relevant also today. It shows one of the obstacles to women leadership, gender perceptions. There are several others, and that is what this conference is all about. Gender equality is key in reaching the SDGs. Women leadership is a crucial part of that. And that is why the theme of this conference is women's leadership for sustainable development. Today, we have gathered some excellent speakers to help us dig into the issue. What is it all about? How can we contribute? What best lessons and concrete examples are there that we can all learn from? We will for sure talk about the obstacles, like gender perceptions, but our main goal is to focus on the opportunities. They are there, so let's move on them. And the experts are not only going to be on the stage, in fact, the whole room is full of people with in-depth knowledge from private sector, from public sector, and from civil society. We strongly believe that it is by working together across sectors that we will succeed. And that is why the overall heading for this conference is New Connections. Our ambition is that when we leave this conference today, we feel inspired, we have learned from each other, and we have made new and strong connections that will advance women's leadership in the sectors that we represent. And to help us to reach that ambition, let me introduce you to Mark Edo. He brings 15 years of experience in international media, and he is a very good friend of CARE. Mark, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Gree. Thank you, and uh, good morning to all of you. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, it's great to be back here again. Uh, looking at that video there, I think I have that hat of the guy, and I'm never wearing it again, ever. Um, so good morning. I'm really pleased uh, to be back here again for, for a second year running uh, at New Connections, and it's bigger and more grand than it was 
uh, last year. This year we're graced by the presence of the Crown Princess of Norway and Norway's new uh, foreign minister, Minister of Foreign Affairs, as well as the Mayor of Oslo I see there. You're most welcome. And other dignitaries and heads of organizations. Incidentally, as I was waiting for you at the door, uh, I was speaking to um, one of our colleagues here, who shall remain nameless on her own request, and she used to work in this building. And she said that this used to be the boardroom filled with smoke. So I asked her, were there any women at that time? Her answer, no, not, not a single one. But times have indeed changed. There seems to be twice as many people this year as there were, was last year at this con conference. And it's testimony to how important the issue of gender diversity uh, is. And that goes not just for the developed world, but also for the developing world as well. Now, I have three daughters. And like most parents, I tell them, you can be anything you want to be in this world when you grow up. Yet if we look at the numbers, and if we look at the pace of, of, of progress in diversity, it tells a different story. In almost all corners of the world, women are not represented enough in leadership and entrepreneurial roles. Take the USA, for example. This is an interesting statistic. It's the world's biggest economy, but men dominate the upper echelons of business. Women hold only 15% of seats on the boards of major companies. And in fact, this will uh, interest you. There are more directors with the first names James, Robert, William, and John than there are women directors. <laughs> uh, and, and we talk about diversity. If we start talking about, when we talk about ethnicity and diversity, it's, the, the, the picture is even grimmer. There's less than 3% of Fortune 500 directors uh, women, are women of color. So although more women are embracing entrepreneurship, they often face challenges that are not typically shared by men. Yes, we all say that we want diversity. That's no doubt, there's no doubt about that. But the disparities are still there. So what do we need to do and what do we need to do to change that? You'll hear a lot said about the UN Sustainable Development Goals, uh, the SDGs today, and in particular, goal number five, which is gender equality. Uh, but it's an immutable fact that gender equality runs through all the SDGs, that we won't achieve any of those goals if we don't get gender inclusion and gender equality right. Today is divided into three parts. In part one, we'll hear from a diverse range of speakers on why it's smart to invest in women leaders. In part two, we drill down into what strategies the private sector can do uh, to promote women leaderships in corporations. And we'll hear from the likes of Google, Ikea, Statoil, uh, and Yara on that. And to round it up, finally, in uh, part three, we'll crystal ball gaze into the future. And we'll see how we can put into practice some of the lessons learned from today. Now, since 1905, Norway has had more than 30 foreign ministers. But it wasn't until last month that it got its first female foreign minister. To give the introductory speech to kick it off today, it's my great pleasure to welcome Ine Eriksen Soraida. Thank you, and uh, Your Royal Highness, Mayor of Oslo, Guri, uh, and everyone else here, Nurfun and NHO, thank you so much for the invitation, and I'm so glad to see that so many people have turned out today. Let's just for a moment turn the clock back to 1995, to the UN Women Conference in Beijing. In Beijing, the world agreed on a platform for action to remove all obstacles to women's participation through a full and equal share in economic, social, cultural, and political decision-making. The progress that we made since then has been remarkable in some instances, but not for everyone and not everywhere. Just two years ago, the world agreed on the SDGs. Of 22 years after the Beijing conference, SDG 5 is still needed if we are to achieve gender equality and empower all women 
and all girls. When I tell you that gender equality is necessary to make the SDGs a reality, I know that I am preaching to the converted. I'm stating the obvious of the day. But still, it's needed. We, we do have a long way to go. Ensuring women's participation in economic life is not only an issue in developing countries, but also in developed countries, also here in Norway. The Global Gender Gap Report for 2017, published by the World Economic Forum recently, show that given the current trends, it will take us, brace yourselves, 217 years to close the economic gender gap. To say that that is not fast enough is probably the understatement of the day. Um, but if we are to achieve the world that we want by 2030, it simply must be gender equal. And this is not a question of why, it's a question of how. We just got a taste of what former Prime Minister Gro Harlem Brundtland was up against in the late 70s and the early 80s. Norway had to get used to the prospect of having a female prime minister. But she changed the perception of what makes a leader, and she made it a reality. She paved the way for Anna Solberg, she paved the way for me, and countless other women in a holding office today. The government is committed to realizing SDG 5, both at home and also through foreign and development policy. To achieve this, one of the main things we need to do is exactly what was done when women broke the glass ceiling of Norwegian politics. We have to change norms, perceptions, and expectations. I come from four years as Minister of Defense. And in Norway, we have this tradition of having female ministers of defense. Internationally, we were, we were not too many, I can tell you, but still. Um, that caused quite a stir internationally. And sometimes, for real, I got asked if it was possible for a man to become a defense minister in Norway. <laughs> and uh, of course, I um, said, well, it's not obvious, no, uh, but if he works hard, he can, he can, of course, he can make it, he can make it. But the public sector and organizations like CARE and the state-owned development finance institution, NURAT, they're fairly gender balanced. In partly or fully state-owned companies in Norway, close to 50% of the board members are women. Confederation of Norwegian Enterprises Female Future Program is also a very good example on a concrete measure to, that has been taken to recruit more women to senior positions. However, in the private sector, only 30% of managers are women. Women make up only around 20% of the board members. Norway cannot afford to not use the full potential of our human resources. A new study was recently, uh, was recently released and it indicates that companies where one third of the leadership consists of women is 15% more profitable than companies where you don't have women at all. And of course, you can say a lot about these surveys and I don't think we should attach too much um, into them, but nevertheless, Businesses that don't discriminate women among their workforce and that has a lot of diversity among the workforce obviously seems more profitable. So if nothing else, that's a very good argument. Women should have a natural place at the table when decisions are made also in the private sector. And in order to achieve that gender balance, men have to take as much responsibility for equality as women. Closing the gender gap will have immense economic impact. Real equality depends on getting men engaged and aware. For many years, I've been working on the 1325 agenda. One of my main points has always been that we have to engage men. My fear is that the 1325 agenda, the equality agenda, is a sideshow when the rest of the conference is finished. This is not a sideshow. This is the main event. 
And I think that one of the most important action points that we can undertake is to engage men. Otherwise, we have no possibility to actually change the perceptions, change the norms, and change the way we look at leadership. Ensuring equal opportunities for women is a key cross-cutting theme in Norway's development policy. And girls and women must be allowed to take part in the growing economy. On December 12, I will be in Argentina at the WTO Ministerial Meeting on Trade. And at that day, we will also launch a new initiative that we wholeheartedly support about she trades. This is about including women in economic growth, in prosperity, and in board rooms. Women's and girls' access to health services, education, energy, and jobs are priorities in our development policy, and also in our humanitarian assistance. Taking the action plan for women's rights and gender equality in foreign and development policy as our basis, we will work to ensure full economic rights for women and equal opportunities to participate in the labor market. Women's economic independence can only be realized if they have full economic rights and access to capital. Norway has joined the Women Entrepreneurs Finance Initiative, WeFi, a very clever title, I think. It was launched this autumn by the World Bank and supported by the G20. WeFi aims to unlock more than $1 billion in international financing institution and commercial financing. The goal is to achieve women's entrepreneurship and to help women develop in developing countries increase their access to finance, to markets, to technology and networks that they need to start and to grow a business. Norway has committed 90 million Norwegian kroner to the launch of WeFi. A combination of male and female leaders in politics and businesses provides a mix of expertise and competence, and that is what drives development. It allows our societies to prosper. And we must work to change the perceptions and the expectations of what a leader is. We all have a responsibility to do this. Private sector, public sector, politics, media, NGOs. I would like to thank CARE, Nurfund and Ho for uh, creating this platform for discussion. And I especially enjoyed what I think will be a very interesting session when you are looking into the crystal ball. I would have loved to be here at that, <laughs> at that session, but I am going back to Parliament. Um, that's also very important, by the way. <laughs> so, my main point to sum it up, is that equality is not a women's issue. It's a societal issue. It's something that we all have to take ownership to. And I will end with uh, a statement that Hillary Clinton made in Beijing in 95 that many of you have heard, that human, human rights are women's rights and women's rights are human rights. And it's, I mean, it's obvious that this has been stated several times afterwards because it's a very good quote. But I also remember Hillary chairing a meeting in uh, the UN Security Council um, room in 2009 when she was foreign minister. And I participated in the meeting and I was, uh, I was in the UN uh, f from the Norwegian parliament. And I had just received a phone call from Anna Solberg asking me if I wanted to chair the Foreign Affairs and Defense Committee. I was scared to death, of course, as always. I had to think about it, of course, as always. Uh, but uh, the point was that I went into a meeting with Hillary Clinton. She sat there, a lot of male leaders from across the world sat there, and they were discussing these issues. And one of the things that she said really made an impact, and I think helped tip me in the right direction, saying, that, okay, I'd like to do this. She was very clear in her statement that violence against women, it's not cultural, it's criminal. And after she said that, I felt that she had laid the foundation for work for women's rights globally. Thank you very much for your attention. I wish you all the best for the rest of the conference.
And Foreign Minister, I have to say that you are also an inspiration to many, so thank you for that. <laughs> thank you. Um, you mentioned Hillary Clinton. Clinton. Well, our next speaker has a Clinton connection. Uh, she was the former director of a Clinton Foundation initiative uh, called No Ceilings, the Full Participation Project. And she's, she's got a really colorful resume, actually, that includes the private sector, uh, civil society and government. And in fact, she was once the chief of staff, I hear, of uh, the leading Democrat, Nancy Pelosi. So without much ado, I'd like to introduce uh, our next speaker, uh, who's going to talk about uh, well, about, about changing the culture, really, before we change uh, the numbers. And that is uh, none other than Terry McCullough. Thank you so much, Mark. Your Royal Highness, Excellencies, everyone, uh, thank you so much. I'm so honored for the opportunity to be here today, and I am grateful to CARE, Norfin, and the other partners for the excellent work you do to try to further gender equality. Um, I am thrilled to be here to talk about how we get to gender equality globally and domestically, and uh, I have had the great good fortune in my career to serve among some extraordinary women leaders, as, as Marcus noted. Um, uh, at this uh, age and stage in my career, it is relatively rare that I have actually served only under women leaders, sadly, very rare in, in the US. Uh, but from that and from them, I have learned a great deal. Um, and I think that there are uh, many lessons we all uh, need to take away as we move forward to ensure that we increase the number of women in leadership. Um, the, it, it seems quite seamless to come uh, following on the heels of the foreign minister who stated uh, the famous uh, quote from Secretary Clinton, women's rights are human rights because my time in leading the full participation project was exactly about taking that moment at the World Conference of Women in Beijing as a marker. It was a moment at which 189 countries signed a platform for action to ensure that we would have the full participation of girls and women in society. So 20 years on, Secretary Clinton, when she was a private citizen at the Clinton Foundation wanted to hold those countries accountable and do an assessment to see what we have learned, what progress we have made so we can understand how far we have come and how much further we need to go toward gender equality. We wanted to make an evidence-based case for the full participation of women and girls, but importantly too, we wanted to reach a variety of audiences, government, civil society, the private sector, but also a younger generation that perhaps in many ways didn't necessarily uh, identify gender inequality as an issue that affected them directly. We hoped to disabuse more people of that notion by presenting the data. So we spent more than a year collecting data, most of it not new, data from very uh, reputed sources, uh, the World Economic Forum, the UN, um, many different um, places to create a, a report uh, over 190 countries, uh, over 20 years on a variety of issues, education, health, violence against women, economic participation, peace and security, political leadership, so we could see how far we have come. Um, we realized from this exercise that progress is possible, but we can't manage what we can't measure. So we collected this data. We have a fabulous website, noceilings.org, if you ever have a few moments or maybe an hour to go through all of the data. But one of the first findings that really opened our eyes was that, frankly, we were missing an enormous amount of data. There were countries uh, that were missing entire years of gender data, either because of the cost or because the governments had not made collection of that data a priority. And in some areas, as, as many of you know, when you look at the issue of violence, it's very difficult to collect that kind of data. So first we saw data is key. We don't have enough. We need to prioritize the collection and the transparency of gender data. We did find progress, certainly as has been mentioned. We found 
Uh, for example, women are living healthier and longer lives than ever before over the last 20 years, which is exciting. We also learned that we have almost totally closed the gender gap in girls' primary education, which is so important. We then identified many areas of challenge. We are nowhere near closing the gender gap in secondary education for girls. Um, we know that uh, in terms of violence against women, one in three women globally has been either physically or sexually assaulted. We know that over those 20 years, women's economic participation remained almost stagnant. We made no progress, and as was noted, we learned recently, we are even backsliding in that particular area. So these are some of the initial findings that we saw that we recognized uh, here are the places in which we need to make change. So the questions then become how. We, we also, we know, back to women's rights or human rights, we know it is the right thing to do uh, to pursue and achieve gender equality, but we also need to make clear to people who aren't convinced by our, our argument that it is right, that it is smart, that we can make an economic case. And we have seen uh, a lot of attention around a uh, McKinsey report in uh, 2016, which made very clear that if women participate in the economy identically to men, we could add as much as $28 trillion to the GDP, which is roughly the size of the economies in the US and China. Enormous opportunity. Because we are leaving half the population away from the table, we are leaving an enormous amount of economic benefit off the table. One would think that would be an immediate trigger. One would think that would be a cause for immediate quick action. Yet here we are. Just as 20 years ago, these countries focused on a platform for action for full participation for women and girls, we mentioned that we are focused now on the Sustainable Development Goals, and in particular, Goal 5, around gender equality and how important it is to achieve that by 2030. But certainly, as uh, has been noted, we can't look at that goal separate and apart from the others. This is a moment of new connections. We need to constantly be take, making the connections and understand that as women, our economic participation and our abilities for leadership are deeply rooted in our experiences, not just with gender, but geography, income, race, education, health, our experiences with violence, child marriage, our climate, our legal rights, our access to asset, assets and resources, and, and who leads us, and, and so much more. So we need to think about all of this in a very intersectional way. We can't keep it separate and apart. So when we look at all of this challenge, how do we get to a point where we can move further in economic participation when, when we have remained stagnant in that place for two decades? We've mentioned the, the World Economic Forum Global Gender Report has been, the, the, the recent release of, of the report has been distressing to many of us because it noted that we in fact have, uh, the gap has in fact widened for women uh, over the last year. And we know that women's leadership is key to solving that challenge. Yet the numbers are low and progress has been slow. Fewer than 50% of leaders, and that's deeply generous, uh, in the private sector are women. And over the past decade, the World Economic Forum noted that the number increased only by 2% in 12 sectors that they studied. One of the conundrums that we face is that often the solution to increasing the number of women in leadership is to have more women in leadership. <laughs> Sounds simple. <laughs> well, it should be, yet it's not. We have seen real progress in the growth of women-owned businesses over the last 20 years and especially in the last several years, which I know you will hear more about from our other speakers. And uh, I'm excited to hear uh, uh, their thoughts about both the progress in access to assets and access to capital for women entrepreneurs. One of my former women leader employers, uh, Tori Birch, the CEO of her own fashion retail company said she created her own company uh, both to help other 
uh, women start their own companies eventually for her to be able to be that resource, but also to be able to create the workplace in which she wanted to work, which would be fa fantastic for the pursuit of gender equity if more women created businesses and approached, uh, uh, approached building their business that way. Um, but while women uh, entrepreneurs and women-owned businesses can be part of the engine that drives uh, economic growth, it is not the entire story. We know in the private sector modest progress has been made in women's leadership. The share of women CEOs in the Fortune 500 in our study grew from 0% 20 years ago to 5% a couple of years ago to now we have this year reached our all-time high at a little over 6%. <laughs> Again, we celebrate progress, yet we realize oh, we're still in the single digits. That's, we need more. We need more progress. We also, as has been noted, remain underrepresented on corporate boards. And we've talked about those statistics, and I know that we are, we are um, fortunate to be here today in a country that is more gender equal than others, and one that had uh, an innovative approach to um, uh, uh, introducing gender incentives around board participation. So you see the real difference in numbers as a result. We've talked too already about the true economic benefits that come with having more women in decision making roles. There was a recent Credit Suisse report that talked about how women who are, there, when there are companies with more women in decision making roles, they continue to generate higher profits. Again, this makes sense from a, from a human rights perspective, from an economic perspective, yet here we are. Well, we'd, we said uh, at the outset we were going to talk about opportunities uh, and not spend as much time on barriers, but let's look at these barriers and see, whether, see where the opportunities are. When we look at barriers to leadership of women, we start, of course, with gender perceptions, with culture, social norms about the roles of women, and beliefs about their abilities to be effective leaders continue to limit their leadership potential. Then we look at the practical. We look at the global gender wage gap, which again has remained somewhat stagnant over the last 20 years. We look at how women are impacted not just in the workplace, but in the home, in the realm of unpaid work time. Women's economic opportunities and their leadership opportunities are limited by the lopsided role in unpaid work in the home. Women in every country bear greater responsibility for childcare and housework. On average, women devote up to three hours more each day. Imagine what else you could do with those three hours each day to housework than men and one to four fewer hours than men in work outside the home. In high-income countries like the US, women spend twice as much time on unpaid work as men. According to our study here in Norway, our research found that women spend about three and a half hours a day on unpaid work as opposed to about two and a quarter for men. Another area in which we see uh, a real disparity that to change uh, uh, laws and policies could have great benefits is parental leave and parental responsibility. Nearly all countries, with the glaring exception of the United States, the only high-income country without paid parental leave policy. Uh, nearly all countries provide for paid maternal leave, but other policies are needed. Around half of countries have provide, provided paid paternal leave or gender-neutral leave. And research has shown that men are more likely to take that leave if you name it as such. Um, my time is running out, and there's so many areas in which we can engage here, so I'll go just briefly. Legal rights, um, there are still countries in which women uh, are discriminated against legally, which make it a barrier for them. Access to mentors and sponsors, we all tend to mentor people who look like us, so broadening that area is really important. Representation, you can't be what you can't see. This initially seems like a small change, but it has enormous impact. We worked with the Gates Foundation on our uh, uh, full participation project, and Melinda Gates once told a story about how when she became a manager at the Microsoft Corporation, she looked around and saw three other women managers. So one by one, she tried to adopt the style of each of them until she realized 
hey, I'm my own person. But because there were so few women in leadership, the tendency is to project all onto the few that are there. We are less likely to uh, be ourselves because there are fewer of us. It is impossible for me to stand here and talk about women's opportunities for leadership without acknowledging the uh, public conversation that has erupted in the latter half of this year come to be known as the Me Too movement. Um, fundamentally, if we do not work to create truly inclusive workplaces, and if, if men continue to be allowed to abuse positions of power and refuse to treat women with respect as supervisors, colleagues, and employees, we can never attain the equity in leadership we seek or deserve, and companies will never retain the talent that we bring. It's devastating to consider as we are learning more and more about experiences women have held private that are, they are now courageously being uh, making public, what opportunity has been lost by them not pursuing whatever professional realm because of an experience like this that they have. There are many different corporate um, efforts that can be made to increase women's leadership. You're going to hear about that from uh, a number of speakers, uh, IKEA has done a number of wonderful things. There's so many examples of corporate collaborations, including the Paradigm for Parity, where 27 companies have made pledges to identify uh, areas for change, really increase the number of women they are going to uh, uh, promote to leadership roles. We, we are at a critical moment globally Awareness of gender equality is, is at an all-time high, and we also have the technological tools to share information and stories in a way that we were never able to before. And we have this pivotal moment with the advent of the Sustainable De Development Goals and uh, the data revolution the UN is pushing forward to really contribute to this global agenda in a meaningful way. If I were to share with you just three things as we move forward, Collect data and be transparent around where women lead in your company, in your organization. Challenge the bias, the unconscious bias we all have, and recognize it is in all of us, how do we confront it around gender roles? And then expand your circle. Meet new people beyond where you are and offer them access to, uh, to opportunity to leave, to lead, so that they don't leave. Progress is possible, but it is our responsibility. Thank you so much. Terry, that was interesting. Very interesting. Thank you very much. Uh, now, uh, moving on. By the way, uh, just um, uh, one thing. Uh, Hilda, where's uh, Hilda? Hilda, there. Stand up, Hilda. This is Hilda. <laughs> And Hilda has cards. Shows your cards, Hilda. Uh, these, these cards have times on them. So for the speakers uh, that want to know whether they're going under or over, Hilda will very helpfully uh, show you that you're staying on time. Thank you. Thanks, Hilda. OK, l last year, I think it was, uh, Nordea commissioned a really interesting report on, on, on gender diversity in, in the workplace and how it's tied to the success and the sustainability of every business. Um, they analyzed nearly 11,000 publicly uh, traded companies across the globe over the last eight years, and the results were really eye-opening. Um, I'll let the portfolio manager who designed the study tell you more. Please welcome Robert Nias. Yes. Thanks for the invitation. So, yeah, I'm a portfolio manager within Odeo. So my job is to invest in company. I've been doing that for more than 25 years. And my target is to get as good performance as possible. And in trying to find the best company, it's important to look at different factors. And then I calculate typically on several factors. And one factor I did recently calculate was on this gender diversity. And that uh, got a lot of attention. So. Yeah, it was in Washington Post. It was actually in newspapers all over the world. So there's a lot of interesting calculation we did. If I look a bit into the, the calculations, 
Then the first question could be, how many of the biggest companies in the world have a woman as a leader? I'm mean, using the universe of 11,000 companies because that is what we, those companies we're looking into when we're doing analysis of other factors. If you look at the numbers, then uh, they are quite clear. It's actually 96% of the company that have both a man as a CAO and head of the board. If you're looking at those that are women on board position, that is a half percent. But then you have 1.9% where you have a woman as a CAO, and then 1.6% where the man is a CAO, but a woman is ahead of the board. So it's clearly not diversity. And then it could be interesting to look at which country do we have most uh, CAO. You should perhaps expect the Nordics or the Scandinavian countries, but that's not the case. If we're looking at the, the number of companies of those 11,000, then US is the biggest one, followed by China, Taiwan, Great Britain, and India. And of course, the main reason for that is that there's more companies in the US and China than in Nordics. So I have the next page showing the share of companies. Not the absolute numbers, but the share. And for those that have most, these are the 10 most, then you have Australia on top, Hong Kong, Great Britain. But actually, it's not that big deviation. It's between 3 and 5% in most countries. So it's the same situation. In Norway, it's the same. We have very few of the biggest companies stock listed that have a female as CEO. So that was the background. And then, more interestingly, how has the performance been? So for those 11,000 companies, what has the performance been in the old companies and those companies where we have a female as a CAO? So that calculation we, we did this autumn. And that was quite interesting results. If you look at the results, then it's split year by year. So we started in uh, looking at the CAO at the end of eight and then the performance in nine. And in nine, it was extremely high numbers. It could be, of course, because in nine, it was only 60 to 70 companies with the female CAO. But then looking at 10, it was also quite good performance. In 11, it was a bit negative for all companies. In 12, again, it was good, and so on, it was very good. So if you aggregate these numbers, taken for the period end of eight until today, doing a geometric calculation, then you get results like this. So looking at the annual performance, it was actually, for the basket of female leaders, it was actually 25% a year, 25%, compared to the market at 11%. Of course, we're comparing a couple of hundred companies to 11,000, but anyway, it was quite, uh, quite interesting results. And then digging more into numbers, I'm trying to explain what could be the reason for this. And I think uh, one reason is, as we have on the next page, and this is a bit diffi difficult to understand. For, for that, it's showing that all companies, where you have 96%, 98% men, the analysts following the company expect the company to grow with 9.7%. And for the female leaders, only 74 So that's not as good. But the main point here is that this is the expected growth and not actual growth. So looking at all company long term, the actual growth is 5%. So actually, the women promise less but give better results. <laughs> and then the second argument is, uh, is because if you assume that uh, there is both the women and men have the same competence of being a leader, then of course it's 40 times as many men as a woman. So of course that those women be, becoming a CEO is probably better qualified than a man becoming a CEO. And, um, and the last point I have in my discussion is, is to look at the type of company. If you show the next page, then you then if you look at different indices in the equity market, then in the regular equity market, it's 4% of the CAO is a woman. But if you look at the index called the quality index, that is company that have better earnings long term, less volatility, there you have 9% women. So it could be that the good company tends to promote women as a CAO, and that is a partly explanation of the good performance. But anyhow, the, the calculation we've done shows that performance has been, uh, has been great. So if you nearly 10 years ago had invested in company with uh, women as a CEO, then you would have had very strong performance. <laughs> so.
Thank you, Robert. Thank you very much, Robert. Um, now, the, it's clear that the world needs more entrepreneurs. It, it needs more female entrepreneurs. Um, Business Partners International, or BPI, uh, provides customized, customized financial services, uh, support, mentorship, and other services uh, for SMEs a, a across Africa. They're in Kenya, Malawi, Namibia, Rwanda, Uganda, and Zambia. Um, please welcome Sally Kitonga from BPI. Thank you, Mark. Her Royal Highness, Minister of Foreign Affairs, the Mayor, distinguished guests, all protocols observed. Good morning. <laughs> it is a pleasure for me and an honor to be here, all the way from Kenya, coming to your beautiful country, despite the weather, <laughs> coming to your beautiful country, but it's really, really an honor for me to be here. Thank you, Care and Norfan, for inviting me not only to be a participant um, in this conference, but to be part of this very, very important and pertinent topic about women and leadership. Um, I'll take you through a brief presentation on how it is in our world of private equity, in the financial, um, financial services sector. Just a bit of introduction, and I won't dwell on that because of, of time. Um, Kenya is an emerging economy. We are currently a population of 46 million, and our urban population is currently 25%, with Nairobi, the capital city, at about 4, 4 million. Our current um, growth rate is at 5%. It's been a bit subdued this year because of what has been happening. Uh, but we've been making good, good inroads, and we hope to, to stabilize after, after this political impasse that, we, that we've had. Our key industry sectors are agriculture, manufacturing, tourism, transport, and building and construction. With agriculture being 25% of our GDP, GDP, which currently stands at US dollars 70 billion. Um, agriculture actually contributes 65% of our exports out of, out of Kenya. Who is business partners? For the benefit of those of you who don't know who we are, we're basically a specialized risk finance company that was set up in 1981 based on a need for the formation of an organization that would form part of a development plan to stimulate small business entrepreneurship. The organization aims to do the following. One is to provide customized financial solutions through term loans to small and medium-sized businesses. Secondly, in addition to that, is to provide mentorship and technical assistance. So it's not just about the money, it's also about mentorship and working hand in hand with the SMEs, and also helping the SMEs who we fund with assistance in acquiring their own business premises and value-added services. So that's what we do in the SME space, and currently we are in South Africa, which is where the organization started. Kenya was the first office out of, um, out of South Africa, followed by Rwanda, Uganda, Malawi, Zambia, and Namibia. Moving on, just to understand the principles of our program, I thought it would be important for me to highlight that, is really to provide a development impact. What we seek to do as business partners is to unleash those entrepreneurs who pursue wealth not only for themselves, but also who help to create jobs for many. Purely in the SME sector, who we believe, and I'm sure you'll agree with me, are the middle class and the fulcrum of any successful democracy, but we want to do that in a financially sustainable manner. That's the key principle of our program. Let me then give you, as we go into um, the key subject matter of today. A little bit of, of, of fact coming from our side of the world. Kenya women's senior leadership representation is not unique to what I've been hearing from the earlier speakers. A recent study was done by the Kenya Institute of Management and we found, it was found that of the 62 listed companies 
in Kenya, listed on the Nairobi Stock Exchange, board representation had made marginal gains, but only stood at 21%, which is still below the 30% constitutional requirement in our country. Going further, in terms now of board chairmanship, we only had 7.7% of women holding board chairmanship, which is slightly better than the 3.9 at a global level and 7.3 at a continental level, but it's still way below, way below the 30%. Having looked at again all those 62 companies and looking at the senior women, in, women in senior management, we only were able to record 26%. So still a lot, of, a lot needs to be done. Let me come closer to our recent election, and I'm sure you've all been following what has been happening in good Kenya. We had an election, and for the first time, we have 47 counties. For the first time, we had three women making it as governors out of 47. That was, a <laughs> that was an achievement for us. Of the 68 senators, again, there were three women who made it. So that for us was, was, was an achievement because before it has never been heard of. In terms of women who made it to parliament, in the last election we had 16 women and six more increased. So now we're at 22 out of a number of 349. Very, very low percentage, but an improvement. So we can see that our statistics are very, very much representative of what's happening globally. I believe the challenges are more or less, more or less the same. So what did the study also find? The interesting thing is that 58% of the women on boards have postgraduate degrees compared to 43% of the men. And yet the women on boards only represent 21% but they're actually more educated. And on the flip side, only 1% of the women have diplomas compared to the, women, to the men who have 6%. So what we're seeing, especially in our region, is that, and it's, and, and it's true, the women are actually more educated, especially in more senior positions, but the opportunities for them are not being fully opened up to them. Studies also in regards to, to the women representation in Kenya has shown that the organizations that had had at least 25% representation in boards by women and more diversity are actually performing better. There's a more positive impact on financial better, uh, performance in terms of assets and revenue. So what is that telling us? That's telling us that we need to increase this number because there is a, marked, a, a definite valid results that are seen where there's more inclusion. Of, of women. Let me come closer to my industry in private equity. Here are some global facts. The number of women in my industry in private equity globally is only 17.9%. In East Africa, it's averaging 23%. The industry is still young, but it's only averaging about 23%. Let's go a little bit further. In senior positions in private equity, there's only a small representation of senior women, 10.5% compared to the junior roles. So you find that in the private equity space, the more junior roles have more women, but as you rise higher, only 10.5% globally have women. When we look at then also at the investment teams in those private equity, uh, in the private equity space, we only have an average of 15%. Only an average. So when we go to that, the next, that slide, I'm basically wanting to show you what is the cause and what, so that we can start thinking about it. What is causing all this? Because globally, female representation in private equity is very low. And a good example is actually in Kenya, I've seen it. And why is that? One of the facts is that senior management in private equity is largely dominated by men, who therefore 
exert a greater influence towards hiring more men. We've also found that the talent pool amongst the females is very low. And because our industry is very, very specialized, we need certain technical qualifications, we find that it's very difficult to pull that talent into our organizations. An interesting fact also is that private equity firms, we usually operate as small, um, small entities with very few employees, making it less attractive for female managers in senior position due to the work-life balance. It is a challenging sector, and because of the challenge of the work-life balance, you find that many times it doesn't attract many women. And lastly, there are very few women amongst us in private equity who can actually be role models. We're very, very few. I attend functions where, um, in, in Nairobi where different players are, and I always find that we're not more than five or 10 amongst the many men in the industry. And so we find that because we are very few role models, there are very few women, younger women, who can look up to the industry and opt for a career in, in private equity. Let me give you some data then also um, in terms of business partners and what we're doing um, to, to make sure we have gender balance. An interesting fact amongst our East African operations, Kenya, Uganda, and Rwanda, Rwanda, is that of the total of our total employees, Kenya has the highest number of female employees, um, led by me as a country manager. <laughs> as a country manager, have five, uh, we are five female employees and one gentleman. So we represent about 83% of, of the gender balance in that office. Um, but when we look at Uganda and, and Rwanda, we find that when we look at the grand total, the female representation is 53.8%, which is good. We've made good strides. And let me just clarify that at Business Partners, we have not put a cap on, on any gender um, amount that we, we must have in each office. What I've actually realized is that during the recruitment, because of what's happening back in, especially in our country, in the last few years, there has been a deliberate effort on focusing on the girl child. Focus on the girl child, educating them, making sure that they can go, to encouraging them, telling them that they can pursue courses like engineering, they can pursue subjects such as mathematics, such as the sciences. And when we put out there um, a recruitment advert, we're finding that the girls are coming out. They're coming out, they're coming out strongly. So out of no deliberate effort, I have found like in my office, that have been able to recruit more women who've come out, who've, who are coming out stronger, um, especially deliberately um, um, well qualified, well qualified and ready to take on the take on the challenge. So that is a positive stride that 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 is coming out, and I thought I'd highlight that. Um, let me just talk also about our, our targeted funding, uh, targeted approach to gender funding. At business partners, we deliberately target. 30% of our portfolio to be women owned, uh, to be women owned, and we have managed to do that. In our previous first fund, we managed to achieve 33.8% gender um, out of a total fund size of 25.7 .7 million dollars. In our current fund, we're standing at 39% being represented by women owned businesses um, in, in, in our portfolio. What we do at Business Partners is as we deliberately make sure that this is a key performance indicator for staff so that they can deliberately ensure that women are being represented on the portfolio and they are measured on it as a, as a key performance indicator. Studies have shown us since we started off in 2006 that of all our clients, those, that were women, those loans that were non-performing, only 33.4% were women-funded loans. And those were just mainly in retail service stations and business services. For the loans that were under legal control, only 33.2% were women funded. Again, very, very encouraging. And 
Some of the examples of women who have done well in that portfolio included a dairy processor, printing, education, and even dry cleaning summary, uh, uh, services. So in summary, for us, what it showed us as business partners based on the, on the track record that we had is that while the portfolio had less women business owned businesses borrowing, it showed that they performed better than those businesses that were male owned. And so what that does for us, it makes us put more effort in looking for women owned businesses because the statistics have showed us that they're better pairs and they run their businesses much better. Okay. So as I run to start concluding, I'd also want to share this very important slide with you where we look at the BPI investee clients amongst our portfolio versus the Kenyan listed companies. And based on our studies as well, we saw that women, amongst those that were women managers, the BPI portfolio had 42% women and the Kenyan listed companies 26%. Those where they had board directors amongst our investee clients, they were 39% and the listed companies 21%. In the BPI investee clients, the total, out of the total employees, 44% were women. So it is encouraging to see that. And based on that, what I could share with you is that the gender balance is so, so critical, just based on the facts that I've given you. And from my experience, I think it is, something that is so, so relevant because I've seen it helping us, especially in our deal sourcing, having a good gender balance. As a country manager, if I am able to attend forums where there are women, women in business, I can network with them, they trust me, and it's easier for me even in deal sourcing. But having that diversity helps us perform better because of the different skills. And then also the performance has been good purely because of I believe strongly because of the different strengths the gender balance brings and making the, the business profitable. So as I conclude, those are just um, some highlights on what I think we should do forward. And I think we'll be discussing them in um, at a later, at, uh, a later um, forum when we have the panel. But really, really, thank you for listening to me and thank you for having me once again. Yeah. Thank you, Sally Gitonga from BPI. Thank you for that. That was quite illuminating. Uh, now, uh, I'm going to ask you all uh, please to rise because the Crown Princess has to depart now with the Foreign Minister. And we're so glad that you attended. In fact, I think it's, I'm going to break protocol and ask you to give her a round of applause as well. Thank you. Okay, there's much more to come now. So, um, as, as we've seen, women face many challenges uh, on the way to realizing their rights and fulfilling their full potential. Uh, we want to show you a short film uh, by the Norwegian director Thorbjörn Ha and the production company Babushka. It was made uh, for Care Norway and it highlights I can only say the absurdity, probably, and the consequences of laws and policies that limit women's economic opportunities. Can you roll the film, please? I have one simple request. That all laws should be equal for men and women. I ask for a society where education is every human's right. Where I don't need anyone's permission to work outside my home. Where I have the freedom to walk wherever I want. By myself. for the right to open a bank account.
and spend my money as I see fit. A life where I can own property. My request is simple that all laws should apply equally to everyone, that I'm seen for my talents, not my gender. I ask for a life without fear of being molested. if I resist. I have dreams. I have skills. I have ambitions. But I'm a woman. Wow, that was sobering stuff, wasn't it? But it's, uh, it's the reality. Um, challenges vary in degree and character across the world, but gender discrimination is a global problem. Uh, now, Norway, we've heard, uh, is leaps and bounds ahead of, of many countries. It has a compulsory quota for boards that was talked about, uh, all publicly traded companies, uh, and it's probably the oldest such requirement and the most ambitious in the world. But elsewhere, in places like East Africa, there's also the signs of change when it comes to gender diversity. Uh, so to compare and contrast women's leadership in Norway, and in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, I'm very pleased to welcome to the stage uh, the NHO's Christina Ulum Hagen, and whose role, I, I actually couldn't find it in English, so I translated it in <laughs> Google, and it, you were translated with the lofty title, Director of the T Department of Working Life. <laughs> yeah. But apparently it's the more sober head of department for, for labor, markets, and social affairs. Am I right? Yes. <laughs> uh, and then uh, right next to your right is Lillian Simui. Simiu, Lillian Simiu, who is the senior associate at Norfund. I don't have to explain what Norfund is to people here. Lillian's focus is agro-business from farm to fork, I guess, so to speak. And she's come all the way from Norfund's East Africa office in Kenya. Please give them a round of applause. They're our first panel. So many questions, so little time. <laughs> so let, let, me, let, me start, let me start first of all, um, I guess I'm going to start with you, Christina, because you're closest. Um, just, just, we're talking about gender diversity and how your organization tackles and approaches that. So just give me the pricey, the, the short version of, of what your philosophy is at NHO. Well, you know, I represent 25,000 companies in the private sector in Norway. And they are competing for talent, just as everyone else in the labor market. Unfortunately, the percentage of female employees in the private sector is, is low, and it's even sinking. It's only 36% uh, right now. Uh, and our companies are struggling to get the smartest people on board, because they're not accessing the women the way they should be. So. Um, our message is both uh, for the companies to access women as employees, but also as managers. And we think this is really crucial for the companies to be able to compete in the future, that they can access the full human potential that we have in Norway. So we go about this in, in several different ways. Uh, we, have, uh, we advise our companies on how to bring more women up the corporate ladder. 
we do this based on best practices uh, of the companies that actually do have gender balanced uh, management teams. Uh, we are ve a very eager participant in the debate on family policies in Norway and what kind of family policies we think are best suited for both men and women to be able to combine a career with being a caregiver at home. And lastly, we have our flagship program, uh, the Female Future Program, which is a leadership program for female managers in the private sector that has been running since 2003. And now the Female Future Program is also running in uh, Uganda, Tanzania and Kenya. What, what is the Female Future Program? Well, it's a, it's a leadership program that uh, women attend to uh, at the same time as they're doing their ordinary job. We recruit around 25 women every year and they build a very strong network among uh, themselves. Mm. And they are taught in uh, personal leadership, rhetoric, uh, boardroom competencies, and uh, different uh, uh, modules uh, like that. We, we try to improve the content of the program every year, but the core of the program is the very powerful network that these women build with each other and the female future spirit, as we like to call it, uh, boosting each other on the way to more challenging uh, tasks. And, and you've led me to so many other questions about mentoring and networking, but I'll hold off mm. uh, and I'll move to Lillian. Uh, Lillian, uh, Nor Funds really has a very clear philosophy. In fact, you've got a re re very clear focus. Agro-business uh, is your main focus individually uh, uh, as, a, as a manager in the uh, Af East African headquarters, I guess, of Norfund. But Norfund also covers two other main areas as well. It covers uh, uh, financial institutions, so banks, often banking the unbanked, mm -hmm. microfinancing, which is where women come in a lot of times. Women come to take small micro loans. Uh, and the new area, I could call it, uh, of clean energy, which also impacts women and also impacts women's businesses, electricity does as well. Um, you're, you probably have a pair of Wellington boots in your office that are very dirty, full of mud, am I correct? Because you often have to go in the field and speak directly to these people and these uh, and uh, groups of people, uh, um, individual SMEs. So from that unique perspective in Kenya, what, what's the philosophy and approach of Norfund when it comes to gender diversity? Well, as Norfund, we, like you mentioned, we look at three key sectors. That is agribusiness, the one in which I work in day to day, financial institutions and clean energy. And part of our, of our mandate is to make sure that all our investments have a positive impact, developmental impact on the ground. So specifically for agriculture, we find that in Africa especially, most of the small farmers are women. And all our investments are supporting farms that get a lot of their product from smallholder farmers. And there's a direct impact. So when we wear those Wellington boots and go out into the farms, it's women we are finding on the ground mm. doing the actual work and seeking markets, access to markets, which will be discussed later in this program. But then this, this is the kind of people that we're working with on a day-to-day -day basis. And it encourages them very much, like one of the previous speakers mentioned, to see that there are women in the financial industry looking to support them too. So Norfan's mandate also, and also having women on <coughs> staff, makes a very big case for the women who are farmers looking for fi access to finance and access to, to support for their businesses to see that Norfan can invest in agriculture. On the financial institution side, like you mentioned, access to finance is one of the key barriers that women are facing. And Norfund has a specific focus on banks that lend to SMEs. And the key SMEs are owned by women. It's women starting the small businesses, growing them from micro to SME. And Norfund therefore has direct impact on everything that they do. So the, the, the growth of financial inclusion in the region through Norfund's financing has had a great impact on women. And you can see it on the ground coming up. Clean energy. One of the things we're doing in clean energy now is look at smaller investments, microgrids, where you have solar lanterns and solar lamps, and that's what women in villages are using. Mm. And it really is changing their lives, extending the length of their days. So when they, when they go out of the home to work or to run a business and to seek funding and to seek support for their business, for their families, they're able to have a few more hours at the end of their day to take care of what their family requires. So in every area that Norfund is investing in, we find that women are directly benefiting. And we do get the feedback even when we go out there. In the what, what's the feedback? I mean, one question uh, I wanted to know is, as you're going around, are you finding that, that year on year that you're seeing more 
women-owned businesses? Are you seeing that, or, or more women coming out to run businesses, or are you seeing are you seeing that, or is that not noticeable? What we are seeing, and it's a common trend in Africa, is that at the lower level, mm. sort of entry level of, of careers and even within various industries, that's where women are concentrated. But working with North Fund, one of the things I've seen via investments mm. is that women are now coming out of the bottom layer and moving further up the pyramid, mm. growing because of training, getting more ambitious to do more, realizing we can do more. Being empowered. Being empowered, that's the mm -hmm. word. And one of the things also we found that within, within North Fund Investments is that we, we drive corporate governance. Mm -hmm. That's one of the challenges we face in companies in Africa, having the right structures, having the mm -hmm. right reporting structures. And in that conversation about corporate governance and setting up boards within our investments and having strengthening their management teams, we're getting more women filtering up upwards into management. So very, very positive uh, impact we are seeing. And we can even see our investing companies making a conscious effort to seek female talent to grow into their, into their companies. Uh, now, um, Christina, uh, uh, she mentioned corporate governance, Let, but let's, let's talk about government uh, mm -hmm. and policy. Uh, when Robert uh, was uh, uh, showing those uh, results, uh, one of the things that really surprised me uh, was that, the, that where Norway didn't pop up, I expected Norway to pop up in a lot of, uh, of places, and he was talking about the USA, mm. uh, China, and India, and so on. Uh, and, and we were uh, whispering mm. at the back mm. there about why that was. Uh, and could it be that all, we, we get this idea that we put a policy in place and it makes trans transformative change, but it makes change for a segment of women, for women in lower paid to medium middle management positions, and then you see a big jump there. But if you want the CEO job mm. that takes 70 or 80 hours a day of work, then the policies don't really impact you to the degree, and that's why you don't see that, that, those many leaders. Uh, am I reading that correct? Could that be the case, the reason why we don't see Norway up at the top of Robert's figures? Well, yes, I suspect that is the case, because as I whispered to you in the back, in Norway we have a very comprehensive welfare system directed at families, mm. and it's very easy for, for me, for instance, as a normal working mother, to, to work a full time, and I have the kindergarten and the system around me. Uh, but the system, is, and that has achieved, made us achieve a very high female labor market participation rate, so it's higher than everyone, mm. so of fantastic importance to Norway. Uh, but at the same time, that system that we have is very well suited for the average woman who works the average week. Mm. It's not suited for a woman who needs to work late nights or overtime or travel a lot. Mm. So that has been one of the critiques uh, raised against the, the Norwegian system of uh, family policies, that it's, uh, it's very good for nine out of ten women, but it doesn't necessarily help us getting more women CEOs. Mm. Uh, and Terry was saying that the solution to getting women leaders is to get women leaders. Yeah, well, that's, <laughs> that might be a bit of a dilemma. Uh, so you could say, but of course, one solution to this is to get the men more on board. Because if you have a partner at home uh, who takes his share or more of the responsibility, then that frees up time for the woman. And that is why uh, the NHO is actually advocating for uh, paternal leave to be 50% of the per total parental leave. We think the leave time should be split 50%. half 50% and that the father should com come on board. So that could be one solution to this um, dilemma, if you will. Um, also, I feel that this is a bit of a taboo to talk about in Norway. Actually, we like to talk about yes. taboo <laughs> because uh, we're, we're all about we're all very proud of our great kindergarten yeah. system and how this yeah. allows wim for women to to work a lot. A and that's of criticism great. Is, uh, <laughs> is, is, is taboo, but that's good. Yeah. It's good to bring these things out. Uh, you mentioned that word uh, family policy, mm. um, uh, Lillian. They don't use the word work-life balance here. <laughs> that's mm -hmm. interesting, though, isn't it? The but, fact that you you and I, being Africans, yeah, I'm from. Nigeria, you're from Kenya, the two giants of Africa, <laughs> uh, and we use the term work-life balance all the time. Um, but they're, they're replacing that with the word family policy. And it gets you thinking, doesn't it, how powerful words are and how one of the ways to change perceptions and myths is to actually change the language mm. around that. Uh, because if you think work-life balance, it, it, it leads you to believe, I've got to make a choice between mm. work 
uh, and life. And it's a choice, opposing diametrical choice, basically. Mm -hmm. But if you say family policy, you're not, first of all, talking about an individual. You're talking about an inclusive family. And it mentally recalibrates you. Do you feel the same, the same way when you hear this? Because I remember when we were talking about this, you were like, oh, that's right. Yeah. I'm going to use family policy from now on. Absolutely. Hearing family policy is mm. it's a very endearing term and it's mm. very warm because like you say where we are coming from it's work-life balance mm -hmm. and a lot of times it seems like they're exclusive of each other mm. you can only have one and not the other and they don't go very well together mm -hmm. but we are in Kenya one of the things that, are, that just came out this year is we already have a policy coming on board to extend the maternity leave which has been three months for the longest time is now extending to six months mm. and some companies it's not yet signed into law but some corporates are already implementing it so it's a very very great stride forward so as much as we're calling it work-life balance we are mm -hmm. making an effort within the country to give women a lot more support a lot of corporates especially within the private sector are going an extra mile and setting up little crashes, you know, like nurseries at the workplace, so that moms were not able to get someone to take care of their children, can bring their babies to work mm. and put them in the crash, and the, um, the company employs full-time staff to take care of the little nursery, take care of it. So you put your child in there, and you're able to work. It's worked very well, and I think only in the last two, three years, paternity leave has been introduced in Kenya, for example, mm. and it's only two weeks, so it's very impressive when you say 50-50, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> slowly. <laughs> To you, Sally Stam, we're not yet there, but it's an improvement. We now have paternity, to leave, to, uh, paternity leave of two weeks. Now the next move for us in Kenya is to get the men to actually take it. Oh, <laughs> okay. They have it, but they're not taking it. <laughs> All right. it, it is allowed to, have it, to, to go away for two weeks. The, so the, the strides the, are, are coming on slowly. The Norwegian model is, is, is obviously world-renowned. I mean, state, the state can dissolve a company that doesn't comply to the gender quotas of boards. Um, do you think such regulations would work in Africa, both, I, I think, both constitutionally, politically, and culturally? Mm. The, the move has begun. Mm. So for example, in Kenya, we do have a gender quota for, for boards now, which is coming out of a, we have a new constitution which came into effect and acted in the year 2010, which requires a third of all positions, whether in the private sector or public sector, to be held by women. Actually, the correct term is that not one gender should not take up more than two thirds mm -hmm. of any position. So now we have women coming on at least a third. So the quarter is there. The challenge has been to implement it. Mm -hmm. So state owned enterprises, government owned companies are already working on it in terms of implementing it. As much as the law is in the constitution, it has not yet been signed off by parliament, they've been holding off but slowly by slowly it's being implemented. So the positive thing is having the quota gets the women to take those positions. The flip side of that situation, however, is where women are feeling like it's, to it's a token. You're put there just because we need to have a woman Tick on board. A box. <clears throat> Tick a box, you can say, yes, the women are there. So the question has been, and the women are now pushing it. It's slowly coming, but the women are pushing and saying, are you hiring me because I can be able to do the job, or is it just because you need to tick a box? So that's the flip side of getting it to a level where we have the women being interviewed as candidates for position purely on their ability to do the job and less because they are female. Mm -hmm. The quarter is a starting point, but we need to refine it. So it's something we're working towards. In other African countries, South Africa, for example, also has a quarter, and it's, it's I think, just the way to start, and we need to see the positive effect coming going forward. So I've got you here on my red couch here, so I'm going to seize the opportunity to kind of mine you both, uh, both as 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 as, uh, as, as managers, uh, both with your corporate ca uh, caps on, and also uh, as women, as as, as leaders. W what, what is your advice to women entrepreneurs? You meet a lot of them. Uh, let's start with mentoring and and uh, networking. Networking being a big a big thing. What I mean, mm -hmm. network is networking is is is. Oh, very important, but it's not easy. It's not easy for anyone, right? But it's often very difficult uh, for, for women entrepreneurs when they start out, walking into that room full of men most of the time. So uh, what are some of the good starting points uh, for young entrepreneurs, for example? Hmm. Well, maybe making yourself visible is, uh, is always a challenge and maybe a little scary when you do it, but it can be very effective. So if you are, that's one of the things we train our female future participants in. Uh, writing an article in the newspaper, speaking at a conference, uh, that gives you an angle to talk to someone at a conference. Uh, also, we find um, 
uh, in our program that the network among the women themselves is very powerful because uh, very often the women who participate in the Female Future program uh, is maybe the only woman in her own management team and she has no one uh, where she, that she can reflect herself in. But in that group with other female managers, she, found, she finds role models and women who are, know the challenges she experiences every day. And one woman in our program said that uh, in my group of friends at home, uh, I only have women who want to talk about children and family, but in the Female Future program, I find other ambitious women like myself where I'm allowed to be ambitious. And the conversation is broader. Yes, so I thought that was interesting. That's very interesting. Lillian? When I speak to female entrepreneurs, I encourage many of them to go out and join an association. There are a number of women women associations, whether it's within a business sector or if it's agriculture or in the corporate area. So, for example, we have the Federation of Women Lawyers, that's for lawyers. For women in business, we have the Business Network International and we have the Organization of Women in Trade. All these are running in Kenya. So the thing is, to, I've been encouraging female entrepreneurs is, what is your area of interest? What is your business? Step out there. are associations that are looking for members, that have members that you can share ideas with. And the interesting thing is that entrepreneurs will set up meetings around what works with their businesses. So either a lunchtime meeting, if that's what works for an entrepreneur, or an early morning meeting. The Business Network International meets at 6 a.m. for exactly one hour. Mm. Because these entrepreneurs need to go out, open up their businesses, start up their day. So I encourage many of them to go and join these this, uh, associations, share ideas, get exposed to e markets, to what's going on. There are a lot of new legislations coming on in the country, for example. Now we have a procurement law that requires that all tenders set out, a certain percentage has to be attended to or applied for and given to women. Mm -hmm. If the women don't know, how do I go about it? What registrations do I need to have? What licenses do I need to have? These associations have training sessions that expose them. Look, this is the procurement law that is available. This is what you can tender for, the following is the documentation that you can have. And then women entrepreneurs also have a lack of confidence. It's mm. to encourage them. You can do it. Your business is good enough. Something, oh, it's too small. You know, it's just in the mm. kitchen. It's just in the backyard. You can do it. These are the requirements that are all achievable. So these associations have been very, very key. And it's to get them to know that they are available, that they are there. There's one near your neighborhood. And to actually set aside the time to go. Mm. That, you, now you're talking about um, entrepreneurs in, both of you are talking about entrepreneurs in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s and so on. But let's go way back to children, to young girls mm. uh, and the way that young girls are raised. Um, in the, my research to, to, to moderate this event, I came across a really interesting uh, uh, paragraph from something I was reading about this subject and I'm going to read a little bit to you and I want to know your opinions. Uh, it says, the communal consensus building qualities encouraged in young girls can leave women unintentionally downplaying their own worth. So one businesswoman admitted mm. that she always found it difficult to convey her worth as a leader. She said that when I talk about my company, I always find myself saying we mm. instead of I, yet the guys say I instead of we, right? She said, she said, because she feels talking in the first person to discuss successes feels like she's bragging. Mm. Uh, there's probably a bit of Yenta Loven yeah. <laughs> woven into that somewhere. Okay. Um, and she can't shake the idea that if someone knows that she's, it's just her in control, that, they'll, uh, that the value of the company would go down. And I read that and it really sort of jumped out at me. And I wanted to know your response. Are we training or are we teaching? Or do we need to teach our young girls? I've got three daughters. Mm. Do we need to be conscious that we need to teach, teach them uh, in a different way? That the, the, the way that we're subconsciously or co consciously preparing them is not the right way to go into the corporate world. I'm talking about six, seven, eight, nine, ten, fifteen year olds. Mm. Sure, I, I think that really rings true. And I think all of us parents of daughters have to think about that uh, constantly. I think the Norwegian school system is doing quite well and uh, are very conscious about justice and are encouraging uh, girls. So now we see that the heads of youth organizations, for instance, or youth parties in Norway, are girls uh, largely. So something has been accomplished as well. But uh, it's, uh, it's a challenge. Also, the we thing, though, is... Uh, 
you know, maybe that can be also more attuned to modern business life where you try to be, build a team. Inclusive. So exactly. Yeah. So maybe the women are even ahead of their time. Yeah. Speaking of a we instead of a, <laughs> an I. <laughs> maybe we shouldn't all just try to, you know, be like the men. The eyes, Not necessarily. <laughs> Lillian, you can have the last word. Yes, I'll surprise you. In Kenya now, the concern about having stronger voices is, um, is, is in the society. The concern is about young men. Mm. Men between 15 years old and 21. Because the age group of girls that you're talking about, the 7, maybe to 13, are very, very strong. Mm. We had a very huge drive over the last, I'd say, 10 years in Kenya about the girl child, and it's showing. Mm. So, for example, in our country, we have national examinations in the public school system. And the results of the last year's, the 2017 national examinations only came out a week ago. And out of the top 10, out of the top the first 10 candidates nationwide in this year's examination, seven out of 10 were girls. The top student was a girl from a school that is about 500 kilometers out of the capital city. Mm -hmm. So also a very surprising place she was coming from. But the first seven out of 10 candidates were girls. They were interviewed by the media and everywhere we went, even I remember sitting with family and friends that were like, can you see how this young girl expresses herself? Mm -hmm. And then the second more quiet boy's voice was, we're very concerned about the boy child because <laughs> they're getting forgotten. Yeah. So the young girls are yeah. very, very strong. From my experience in Northland, we've been interviewing also interns as part of our, mm. Mm. our growth. And we've realized that the female candidates who come in for interviews, it's impressive. Mm. They express their, um, themselves, they're very, con very confident, the way they carry themselves. This is a student and she gives you her business card. Mm. You know, just a student, but she has a business <laughs> card. And, and it was very, very, very impressive. So the, the, the the thing in Kenya is that the girls are coming out very strongly. Mm. And even in this, this exam that came out a week ago, girls would typically, and the girls' schools, because we also have, we have single-sex schools in our country quite mm. a bit. The single-sex schools, whenever they did very well, it was in religious education, home economics. But now you see the girls are doing well in the sciences. It's mathematics and they're leading in it. And it's, it's the sciences. It's very, very impressive. So girls are coming out very strongly. The next generation, we are very convinced, are going to produce our first female president. <laughs> 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 so the girls are doing well. It's to get the balance. From what Terry said, mm. we need to have, it also involve the men in that conversation because now it's, it's skewed now too much to the girl mm. and then we need to have the men also strengthened mm. so they can support the girl child and be strong as well. So that's the conversation we are now shifting into, which is surprising. I don't think that our country, when they're setting it up for it to come this soon, that we need to be creating a balance very, very soon. But the girls picked up the ball and went running so fast. I, I'm <laughs> sorry that I have to finish this conversation because I'm really enjoying it. But I'll ask you to rise, uh, Lillian and Christina, and acknowledge the applause from the <laughs> audience for our first panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No one drinks more coffee than Norwegians. <laughs> and I know when I say coffee, look, smiles all round. You've earned it, you've earned it. Let's uh, do about 15 minutes, caffeinate up, make some friends, and then be back in here. Thanks. <laughs>